Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here, and we're still doing a little bit of cleanup and catch up with uh, past me's teaching. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about Emma, my personal favorite Austin novel. And this is a good novel for a games class precisely because it is so much about the games people play. Um, as much as Austin's novels are often about dialogue and things left unsaid and things that are kind of talked around in different sorts of ways and the ways we learn to read that, Austin gives us in Emma a kind of proto-detective novel, a novel that almost all of the students at some point in discussion said, you know, I really want to reread to see the things I didn't see the first time. And I think that's very intentional. And it's also in keeping with that, in keeping with the kind of puzzle-like nature of this novel, it has a lot of games in it. So we were really lucky uh, to have at our disposal the podcast, The Thing About Austin, which is an amazing resource I highly recommend, including podcast episodes in, uh, especially from The Thing About Austin, in the teaching of Austin because they are by two academics, well-researched, often in conversation with other experts, both in and out of the academy, and focus on very specific parts of the text. So it's a good model for how close reading can work and how cultural information can enrich our understanding of the text. In this case, we listened to the episode where they interviewed Lynn Festa, who is an expert on puzzles and games, along with basically being one of the most brilliant people I know. So it was very uh, lovely, both as an example of a good podcast, um, if that is something that folks are thinking about doing, because we've been talking about different public forms. Last week, we got to talk to Marcos and I got to meditate a little bit about, you know, writing essays in public. Podcasts are another variant of public scholarship, um, but also these kinds of ways of handling the text, ways of handling secondary information in ways that are just, just incredibly lovely. There are lots of good podcasts out there. The other really good thing about the thing about Austin in particular is it's cut down to time. No episode is more than 30 minutes and most are much shorter. So shameless plug aside, I will note that um, this was a good week and another week where we don't have a game to talk about, aside from the games in the novel itself. These kind of games with words, these games that people are playing with one another, and of course the master game of deception that Emma doesn't see through until it is almost too late. And are there spoilers for a novel that's this old? What an interesting question. I'm not going to spoil it for uh, folks who might stumble across this um, randomly. You should read Emma. Emma is a really good novel. Highly recommended. Although interestingly, as we think about last week and Mansfield Park and the unlikability of uh, Fanny for being super passive, we see in the next published novel, Austin kind of falls over on the other side of the horse. And this is the heroine that Austin thought people wouldn't like because Emma is active. The, her path to education is one that is first about Emma, handsome, clever, and rich. She has all the power that Fanny totally lacks. Um, and it's a question of how is she going to use it rightly and how is she going to be in right relation with others? And it's she is another complex moral figure in these central novels, uh, the last novels to be published in her lifetime, uh, where she's meditating on ethical action in community. Emma does a lot of things right. Um, until it gets to these interpersonal relations. And we spent a lot of time talking about 
again, the introduction of the novel, which is a practice I learned from my own advisors and also one we've been doing across all of the novels. And it's interesting to think about the ways in which the loss of Miss Weston or Mrs. Weston, Miss Taylor turned Mrs. Weston, even though it's not really, a, it's only a loss from the household, not a loss from the neighborhood or community, but that that is being figured as the first sorrow of Emma's life because she cannot remember the loss of her mother. Um, interestingly, as both the students and I noted, her sister getting married was not the big loss of her life, even though her sister is removed not only from the domestic sphere, but from Highbury itself. This is an interesting way of framing affective relationships and the ways that Emma prioritizes people in her world. And also goes a long way of kind of explaining why Harriet can step in to fill the gap. This is another... Uh, this is another under-adapted for games uh, novel, although it's been, of course, adapted any number of times, including in the best Austin adaptation of all time, Clueless. But it is interesting to think about the ways in which the novel could have some interesting branching paths in a kind of non-linear sort of way and thinking about it in that way. Um, so there are so many what ifs, even in this very, this, this most geographically constrained, she moves less than Fanny Price. She moves less than, than women far less wealthy than she is. Um, but she is still constrained and she's a wor woman who has outgrown her fishbowl in many ways. And it's, uh, very interesting to think about, you know, how that plays out and, you know, what's going on with this depiction. I think about Emma a lot, and I think about Emma in different ways every time I read this novel. Um, and I think this is where gameplay and exploration is a kind of under-tapped sort of way of thinking about it. Um, and so... Uh, we were, this is one of the longer Austin novels, and it is indeed complex. There's lots of people peopling Highbury for all that it is a smaller world that Emma is moving within. And so we didn't have any other secondary material for this week that was required. There's always optional stuff that's available um, for people to come back to and, and think about. Um, it was really a kind of moment of reveling in this text. And I think that's because arguably we see Emma as the novel of Austen at the height of her powers. P Pride and Prejudice may be the more popular, but it's less co morally complex uh, than these middle novels. And of the two middle novels, I would argue that Emma manages to do that balance a bit better. We are still getting at the end complex, uh, incomplete, strangely funny, strangely focalized uh, endings. Uh, this, we're, we're never going to see kind of a completely unmitigatedly shiny ending out of Austin. Uh, and I think that's one of the other things that I try to um, draw readers' attention to when I am teaching this novel. So that's Emma. We are now caught up, so hopefully this Thursday uh, when I record, we are going to be talking about uh, Northanger Abbey with my good friend and collaborator on this channel, Emily Kugler, and hopefully that video will get recorded right after we're done. Fingers crossed. Um, until then, see you soon. <laughs>